things like YouTube dramas. People might poo-poo the YouTube drama. It doesn't matter. If you're earning a living playing drums, you're winning in my books. That's yeah. all I ever wanted to do was just earn a living playing drums. I happen to do that through touring, recording, doing a podcast. You know, I do all these peripheral things that aren't to do with drumming as well. But the reason that I'm able to do that is because of things like social media and being able to broadcast to the masses. This is me. I This is the gig I'm doing. I'm currently out with Kim Wilde. Here's a cool picture of me playing with Kim Wilde. I'm currently playing with The Voice Kids. Here's a video of me playing on The Voice Kids. And people see that. And then I get calls for other gigs off the back of that. And I feel like there's this very short sightedness of if I'm not, you know, I don't want to be on social media. It's toxic. Rah, rah, rah. Okay, mm. that's fine. But you're doing yourself and your career a disservice. It's such an easy platform to broadcast to the yeah. world. And yes, you may only get 20 likes. Don't worry about that. Just keep going because all it takes is one person. In fact, a great example of that is, um, so on YouTube, I have a video that I posted in 2011, I think. Wow. Uh, and it was a cover of the Foo Fighters Best of You. I'm wrapped in fairy lights. And that video is the reason that I got the Foo, um, the Foo Fighters gig. Ah, no, <laughs> not the Foo Fighters gig, the darkness gig. Ah, right. And it's because, yeah, they saw that video and then they asked around and it happened to coincide that one of their crew guys knew a crew guy who I can't even remember who it was, who was on a gig with me years ago, went, oh yeah, yeah, she's cool. Give her a call. Wow. That's the reason I got that gig is because they saw that YouTube video and were like, who's this then? Hello and welcome to another episode of Drum for the Song podcast. I am your host, Dane Campbell. Today's lovely guest is Emily Dolan Davis. How is it going, Emily? Hello, it's going well. All the better for seeing you finally. I was saying before we started recording, it, it just feels like forever that we've been trying to sort this out and we're finally here. So I'm so happy right now. <laughs> ah, good, good. Thanks. Thanks so much for, well, for being so accommodating. It was definitely my fault that we had to reschedule the original yeah. date, but, uh, you know, it is, we're both busy people. Um, yeah, we get and, it. And yeah. So listeners, it's difficult to schedule these in sometimes when everyone's on tour and everyone's playing festivals or, or recording at home, uh, which is one thing Emily does. She's got a remote recording studio and a business that does that, which is really interesting. Um, and it's becoming a little bit more common, I suppose, with drummers, um, doing it themselves. It saves the artists a lot of money from actually hiring separate recording studios. That can be very expensive. Um, so we'll talk about that in a little while. But that's one thing that's really interesting about Emily. Um, but I'm going to let you kind of start. Can you explain kind of how you got into the drums and then a little bit about who you've played with and who you're currently playing with? And all the, yeah, all the of millions course. of jobs that you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One thing you have to know about me, I'm someone that doesn't like to sit still. So I'm always like just doing stuff and just trying stuff. So uh, yeah, but a little background about me. My name's Emily Dolan Davis. Uh, I grew up in North London uh, and I sort of grew up around music a lot. My dad played guitar and stuff um, and we had family members that were musicians and I loved music, but I sort of couldn't find an instrument that fit me. Like my dad tried to teach me guitar. I was like, I'm not getting this whole six strings and then like chords. I was like, no, 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 no. This isn't, this isn't the one for me. Um, and basically what happened was I was just at school. Uh, I'd started secondary school. I was a super shy kid, like the shyest, quietest kid. And in the register, they said, oh, there's this drum club starting this lunchtime. And what possessed me to go, oh yeah, that really loud instrument. Yeah, let me give that a go. But something happened. I was just like, all right, yeah, I'll go try that. Anyway. I went to this drum club. There were about 30 kids there. We were all 11 years old. And um, I sat down behind the kit and just sort of did what the teacher was telling me to do. And it was like, I'd, I would just understood it. It's like, it was like they were speaking my language. And I'm not saying that I could play. I wasn't like all of a sudden, oh, it's Dave Wickle behind the kit. It was like, no, 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 not that. But I, I just got it. It just made sense to me. It made sense to my brain. And I just went, you know what? I... I want to do this. I, 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 I feel like there's no going back. And I just fell instantly in love with the drums. 
And then from there, I sort of came home and said to my parents, so I've kind of started playing drums and I kind of like it. And they were like, okay, of course you picked the most like loudest instrument in all the world. Um, but they're like, okay, great. And my dad got really excited. And he was like, okay, you want to be a drummer? The, bear in mind, this is day one. This is his reaction. You want to be a drummer? Amazing. Wait there. And he runs off and he comes back with an album and it was Rush's exit stage left. And he put on YYZ. He was like, you want to hear a drummer? This is a drummer. And I heard it and I was like, my brain just opened up. I was like, this is the most incredible thing I've ever heard in my life. This is unbelievable. I didn't understand what was happening and it was just brilliant. So from there, I just became completely obsessed and I, my parents would take uh, me to blues jams every week. So right. um, we were lucky enough that there were a couple of blues jams local to us. And I mean, I was like this 11, 12 year old girl playing with these sort of 60, 70 year old blokes, which to me at the time, completely normal, completely like wouldn't even think about it. But I, I look back now and I'm like, that's pretty bizarre. Like that's a pretty bizarre sort of scene, if you can imagine it. Um, so I sort of got my legs in terms of playing live, uh, playing songs, working with musicians. Obviously, it's a jam, so you never know what's going to happen. Reading cues off of people, like guitarists, singers, whatever, all the hand signals and all the nuances that nobody really tells you about. And I sort of started understanding that a bit. And then I sort of started getting into bands inside school, then outside school. And it was from about the age of 14, I realized that I could make a living out of this and I wanted to. And I was, I was just like, I knew I loved it, but I didn't know that that could be my profession, if that makes sense. And yeah. I was like, oh, this can, I can make a living. Okay. I'm going to work out how to do that because this is what I want to do. And I remember becoming really obsessed with, uh, I don't know if you remember. So was it Hudson Music had a, v a VHS of Billy Ashbow? It was this one video that I was completely obsessed with. He was the drummer for NSYNC. I didn't even oh, like right. NSYNC. I had <laughs> no, like, I had, I, I did not care about NSYNC. But this video, it was him and he was playing these pop songs and he was doing the thing and he was touring the world. And I was like, this is what I want to do. Like, I want to be that guy. And um, yeah, so then, like I say, I just got into bands and then left school at 18 didn't study in college because I, I had this really irrational fear, which looking back, it's ridiculous, that if you went to music college, then I'd end up sounding like everyone else. And don't ask me why, but that was a huge fear for me, which again, seems ridiculous. And looking back, obviously there's massive benefits to going to college and you know meeting other like-minded musicians and all that. But anyway, I didn't do that. Instead, I got into like covers bands. I was playing with a lot of independent artists, mainly for free in the early days. And my parents sort of said to me, look, let's treat this like uni. So you can stay at home until you're 21 and we'll give you a little bit of allowance, but literally you can only use it for petrol to get to gigs and like rehearsals or whatever. Like that is how much you're going to get. So it wasn't a lot, but I was like, I really appreciate that. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in 2008, I got approached by a band called The Hours who were this indie rock band, basically, at the time. They just had an album out that did quite well. And yeah, they were looking for a second drummer. And I went for the audition and got that. And that was sort of the beginning of my officially professional career, if you like. Um, and from there, I sort of, so I started out with them. And then over the years, I've played with uh, Brian Ferry, doing some corporate shows with him, and then also recording uh, on an album with him, which was a bit mad. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, Tricky, uh, Cher Lloyd, uh, Thompson Twins, Howard Jones. I played with The Darkness for a year, did an album with them. Uh, and currently I'm out with uh, Kim Wilde. And then I also play in the house band on The Voice Kids, which is a show that's on ITV at the moment, um, which musically is probably one of the most challenging things I've ever done and probably the most beneficial to me as a player, as a human. And and yeah, I really enjoy it. So um, yeah. Oh, and I have my studio, obviously. I have my studio. I do remote recording. I've been doing that since 2016. That was off the back of Parting Ways with the Darkness. So yeah, I started out that business and then I also did a podcast for a while as well called A Drummer's Guide 2, which was essentially an answer to a question that nobody asked. But I just thought about what I would have really loved to have had as a kid growing up, like the information that isn't out there about all the things of what it takes to be a professional musician that is not about the playing. Because as we know, the playing is probably about 10% of the job, I'd say. And that might be being generous, you know what I mean? Um, but 
I never knew what the other 90% was when I was that 14 year old girl going, I want to do this as a living. But I get the sense that it's not just the playing thing because everyone can play like that's not a thing. So it must be all the other stuff. So um, I lived it. I worked it out. But I thought, let me just do a bit of a shortcut for other people. And uh, yeah, and here I am. And and I'm very, I consider myself very lucky. And uh, I love I love what I do. What can I say? Amazing. That's so inspiring. Um, and I was going to say that the drummer's guide, too, I think it's such a great idea. It's not the kind of things you're going to learn from your drum teacher. Maybe, you know, maybe in passing, you might mention, oh, well, I used to tour in a band and all this stuff. You know, it depends on the situation. But um, yeah. I had a little skim through the, the YouTube channel, which is really great. And I do recommend that to, to all of my uh, listeners as well. Uh, there's loads of topics on there that they, they kind of, some of them, I noticed the things I talk about with my, like my patrons. I've got a Patreon page. So sometimes we have um, monthly chats to them. And that tends to be when we talk about all these things I don't really mention in the shows themselves. A lot about my personal touring life and experiences. And I'm like, that, that, they're the kind of inf that's the information they want to know. So, yeah, a lot of those things about you know, not, not doing number twos on tour buses and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that that's the first one you picked out because oh, I, hey, you're right. It's, yeah. And it's things like that, you know, people don't know the art, uh, the questions they need to ask. And yeah. I think that's even more of the thing. It's like you wouldn't even know to ask that question if you've never been on a tour bus. But no. imagine, well, I remember being on my very first tour bus and being so terrified of seeming like the amateur. And, you know, you just kind of roll with it and you work it out. But I just thought, God, I, I know that I'm not the only person that feels like this. And the thing that kicked off that very subject was there were three girls that I was working with, with the Thompson twins, and they were new to the situation. And they said to me, we're about to go on this US tour. Like, we're about to go on a bus. None of us have been on a bus. Can you tell us what the sketch is? So I sort of ran on. I mean, bless them. They were probably just completely overwhelmed with information. But I just that was that was part of the catalyst that made me go do you know what this information isn't out there i'm going to yeah. be the one that put it out there why not why why not me Ooh, even though terrifying obviously i was absolutely terrified and a lot of me was going who are you to be the person to talk about this but i just thought you know what Ugh, i need to get over myself and just if even if the response is what do you know i could do better great go do better if that motivates you to go do something then I've won. It, yeah. it doesn't matter to me how you get there. Like I just need other people to feel inspired or motivated or whatever, or educated. Any of those work for me. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's silly if, you know, for, for you to ever, you know, doubt yourself based on what you just told me, all the things you've done in your, you know, I think, I think we're around similar ages or you've done all of that already. That's incredible. And I think, I think most drummers would only dream of, of having a list of things to reel off. Um, and the one thing I'm, I'm specifically interested in, because it's something I've never dabbled in or obviously never had the opportunity to do is the, you know, the ITV, the voice thing, actual yeah. filming and playing live on TV. I'm pres presuming some of it is broadcasted live. Some of it's pre-recorded. Um, how, how does that all yeah. work, that, that world? And how, 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 how do you prepare for such, um, well, Number one, you've obviously got to learn songs or prepare songs with a band. Is that rehearsed? Is it done on the spot? Is it written out? Who comes so, up? Yeah, Just talk about that I'll for a bit. I'll run you through the whole thing because do. it was a whole thing. And and so I had a meeting with the musical director, a guy called Dave Tench, before I went on to the show. And I was the same as you. I was like, so what are we doing? Are we are we learning this? Are we doing exactly the same questions? And he was like, right, let me run you through this. So. The whole sort of nucleus of the voice and why it runs as well as it does, because it's it's quite possibly the most well-oiled machine in terms of like the band and everyone having their roles and doing their part and then everything just works. And for me, the type of personality I have, when I tell you it's my dream gig, everyone knows what they're doing. Everyone's amazing at what they do. Oh, it's heaven. But yeah. anyway, uh, the crux of that is that we probably have to learn about, now what is it at the moment? I think it's like 60 songs uh, for 60 kids in the space of a few days, basically. Wow. But 
we don't get the, first of all, they're not full songs, they're edits of songs or versions of songs, like different styles of songs. So even if you know the song, you don't actually know what you're going to be playing because, you know, and, and I'm sure you have the same thing because you've played a lot of songs. You know, your muscle memory just does it and you just play it and it's because you've done it so many times. You have to fight against that, which is the strangest thing to feel. But as I was, <laughs> sorry, I'm trying to say in a in a cohesive way that is not working. The, the nucleus of this is that it's a reading gig. So all the parts are written down. There's a dedicated guy that writes the charts. Now, when I sat down to have this meeting, my reading, not great. Mm. Not great at all. Like I could read uh, like drum exercises, say, from a drum book. Fine. I'm used to that. I've done that since I was 11. However, I, I have this drum teacher, Mike Dolbear. I don't know if you know Mike. He's quite a big part of the drum community. I know and who he is, yeah. He, yeah. yeah, so um, he's been my teacher since I was 15. And occasionally he would bring out a chart of a song for a sight reading like lesson. And when I tell you, I've played thousands of songs, but put it down on a chart, I would fall apart. All sense of musicality would just fall by the wayside and I wouldn't know what I was doing. It would be like I could not actually play the drums. So when I was sat here hearing this, that so yeah, you need to be able to read. And he was kind of like, look, you don't have to be the greatest reader. And I'm sat there going, I'm, I'm like the worst <laughs> reader ever. So anyway, in my brain, I'm freaking out. And um, he's like, yeah, it's reading. So what happens is we get in the room, we get given the charts, we'll listen through to the edit once, and then we'll just play through it. Maybe, I don't know, maximum three times. Uh, and then we move on to the next song because we've got so much to cover and we just need to get it out like bang, 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 bang. Fine. And <laughs> I'm sat there just like, okay, that's fine. And then the kids come in the next day We'll run it again three times and then you won't hear it again for two weeks and then you record it basically that's kind of the sketch but as i say my reading not great and in my head I'm like, i can't read i can't read i'm rubbish at reading this is terrible i'm gonna ruin this like i can't say no to this it's amazing yeah. and anyway my brain's freaking out and i just go yeah okay yeah i can do it and i was like okay now i've got to work out how to read so i spent like three months <laughs> training myself to death of like reading and doing all that anyway it was absolutely fine and um i sort of got in the room i was terrified absolutely terrified not only because of that but the actual musicians in the band are world class and i'm sure most musicians have this i have massive imposter syndrome i'm like i don't know why i've been called to be here i don't know why i'm in this room but here i am i've done the very most that i can anyway we started playing through the songs and it was just it was a dream and it was one of those ones where, you know, when the musicians around you are so great, you don't actually need to think really. You just need to react and just be in that moment and be present and things just happen and they flow. And it's such a strange experience when that sort of happens. But because it was all written down, that made it possible quicker, if that makes sense, because there was no negotiating with what to play. Oh, what am I meant to be playing? And what? On it wasn't that because it was right there on the page and I just play and everything's locked in. And after that first day, I was like, why isn't everyone doing this reading lock? This is absolutely genius. <laughs> so yeah, it was, a, it was a steep learning curve, but it's now a skill that I have that is just, I think it's completely invaluable and it's facilitated me being able to do the show and we play so many different genres and, you know, it can be a rock tune one second and then I'm picking up my brushes and doing a jazz tune and then it's like a salsa sort of, or Cuban type thing. And you've just got to shift your focus really, really quickly. Um, and then the actual filming days are just the most surreal kind of days. They're sort of 12 hour days where you're sat in a studio, you'll play the kids song once because that's it. People often think, oh yeah, but if they mess up or whatever, they get another shot. No, 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 no. That kid comes on and sings it as you see it. We play it live as you see it and the reactions are as you see it. Um, so, you know, you'll, you'll play the song a couple of minutes, the song, the edit, and then you'll sit there for like half an hour just watching people chat, which is fine, but it's yeah. like, this is so weird. And watching my favorite memory so far is watching Will I Am trying to play the bagpipes. And it was at that moment I was like, this is a very strange job. This is a very strange job and I'm here for it. This is great. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's it's very unique, that's for sure. But um, I, I can, again, consider myself very lucky to be there for sure. Yeah, and, and like you said, those skills now, you'll be, able to, you'll be having those skills. I don't have those skills. I couldn't do that. 
So you're going to be in front of everyone else then if, you know, hopefully the voice will continue for years and years, but if something else comes up that requires something similar, you know, you'll be one of the first people that people will look to and hopefully, you know, you'll keep getting those kind of jobs on top of all the, the usual touring and the recording and, it's amazing that you're doing that and it sounds terrifying to me to be honest well no i i totally get it and it's funny you say about you don't have that skill i didn't honestly when i tell you i didn't have that skill yeah. i didn't wow. but i am the type of person that i'm not good at learning how to do things for the sake of doing them mm. i need a reason and if there's pressure involved oh i'm there i'm so there so i felt like this was a real opportunity for me to face one of the weakest parts of my playing yeah. and and I'm so glad that I did but I'm similar to you I I was like this is terrifying and I can't do this um but then I just did it I just worked out cuz it is being a freelance anything I think but especially musician you just have to have that attitude of I'm just going to work it out I'll just work out how to make it work because that is the music world generally yeah. you know things go wrong you're on tour you know you get stuck somewhere or you end up with a kit that's just a pile of rubbish and you're like oh my gosh well i've got to make a sound out of this because i don't have a choice so let's just make it work and just make something work um and i think all freelance musicians have that same attitude because you just have to really yeah and i think yeah i think i i need to put my head in that kind of mindset a lot more because i think there's certain things i've definitely turned down or or well, maybe if I if I've seen someone looking for a depth gig on a weekend and I'm like, I'm free, but I don't know if I want to put myself through that. Do you know what I mean? And I I, yeah. I, I I'm not I, I'm not one of these people that will take all these opportunities. I should I should do it more often. The one time I did it a few years ago was great, and it you know it wasn't really for money. It was more as a as a favor for a friend, and that mm. kind of made me realize it's a hell of a lot of work, but. For the right reason, I could, you know, I could do this, and they were the band were really impressed and all that. But it was just for a, an originals gig, thirty minute set, and I thought I can do that. Thirty minutes, I can learn that. I think they give me fifty quid at the end of the day as, as thanks. But you know, it wasn't. It was two rehearsals and the day of the gig for that. So it, it wasn't for the money. It was more to help a friend no. out. But <laughs> yeah, but um, but that I think you know, it's a good experience. It's funny you say about that, like the the fear of of that, because I think everyone has that. I have that. I a, a big part of the reason I sort of cultivated such a big network of musicians is I was the depth girl for a long time. You know, the last minute gig that needed a drummer, people knew that they could call me. But when I first started doing that, oh, you better believe I was terrified. But I feel like everything you do, for me at least, if I notice that I'm scared of something, I do know that at some point, if I do enough of it, it will be normalized yeah, and yeah. it will feel exactly the same as, like for instance, for both of us, I saw you were doing a bunch of like festivals and stuff into in front of massive crowds. I'm sure that we're the same in that it's just, you know, it's, it's great, but I don't go on stage going, oh, I'm terrified. I just go, yeah, I'm excited. Let's go do this because yeah. it's become normalized. I tell you what, if I'd have gotten on that stage at age 13, I'd be shaking. I wouldn't be able to play. Like, you know what I mean? So I think it's the same in all sort of like parts of someone's playing or experience that to me, if I feel scared, it's just like, that's a sign I need to do more of it. So I force myself to just do it so much that it doesn't scare me anymore. And um, like I said, I think I'm a bit of a sadistic person to myself, not to other people, but to myself. So, but it does work in my favor, I suppose, even though there is a lot of pain, you know, there is a lot of struggle and, and hard work that goes in, which as we all know, like nobody really sees behind the scenes. They just see mm. the cool Instagram post at the end of it and just go, oh my God, that's amazing. I want to do that. It's like... Yeah, so I've been like in my studio crying over this gig, but you didn't see that, so don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's that's totally great advice. And yeah, one thing that I'm definitely guilty of then, as we've just concluded, is yeah, I probably stay in my comfort zone too much and don't don't push myself out of it, which is something you've obviously done. So well done, <laughs> it's paid off. Um, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, one thing I was going to ask, I noticed. One thing, another thing I've never done that I've seen that you've done, and you kind of alluded it to it earlier on. Kim Wilde, two drummers was that? Is that was that just a one-off, or was that all the time? That is all the time, basically. Uh, I went and depth again, a last-minute depth for the drummer, the Jonathan Atkinson, who's been with Kim for the last 
20 years i think it's it's going to be 20 years next month i think wow. um and we've been friends for years and he was like would you mind just going in and just doing this gig and i was like yeah yeah that's fine anyway gig went super well i knew half the kim band anyway just from being on the circuit and uh yeah it went really well me and kim were chatting in the bar afterwards and she was like oh, i really enjoyed it and as a joke i said oh well you're just gonna have to have two drummers now and she looked at her manager and she went that's a great idea. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I've just, I've just forced myself on this gig, essentially. That's horrendous. Um, but anyway, I spoke to Jonathan and he was like, that's a great idea. Does that mean that I can just play all the kick snare hats and you can take over all the fills and the percussion? I was like, yeah, pretty much. He's like, great. I'm happy with that. So yeah. And it's been like that since uh, 2018. So um, that's amazing. yeah. It's so much fun. And when I tell you being on the road with another drummer you can geek out every day about the things that drummers love to geek out about. Yeah. So the rest of the band hate us so much when we're like, have you seen that new Vista light snare drum that's coming out? And da, 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 da. It's just, it's so good. You get your fix of like, you know, it's like being around other drummers. There's something about just the thing of being a drummer and yeah. we all just love each other so much. Like it's, 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 I love it. I love it's, it so much. It's totally, it's partly why I enjoy making these podcast episodes because I actually get to talk to other drummers. There's, in my touring party with my band, if I'm lucky enough to get a drum tech, he's a backline tech, he's not really a drummer, he'll, he'll set up my kit. So he's not a drum nerd in any way. So I, I have no yeah. one to talk about drum nerd stuff with. So yeah, I, I totally understand what, how that might be really exciting in a touring situation <laughs> or just geeking out on other people's kits and stuff like that. And that's what I like to do at totally. festivals. I'm like, oh, that's... That's, you know, the other day I was looking at um, Mickey D's drum kit at, at Hellfest and it's like you get to see him all close up but backstage and that and like most people would just walk past and think it's a drum kit oh, yeah. and I'm like, oh, yeah. what, 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 what? oh he's got a different the, uh, skin on his yeah. snare <laughs> and, and I'm like, oh, yeah. different, different, in, is that, is that a 20 inch, using. yeah, 20 yeah. inch China, yeah. <laughs> things like that, like well, no one cares it's about. exactly the same. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's, it's like great. that 24-7 with us and we're tag team we're like oh did you go and see uh, Mark Brzezicki's kit it's like no I haven't seen it oh yeah oh yeah look he's using that and yeah so <laughs> I, I, I I get it like, awesome. we need to start like a Drum Nerds Anonymous group or something like that I think uh, we could idea. all be a support for each other in those nerdy times <laughs> that's, a, that's a good idea we're full of good ideas that's great <laughs> the, when, let's talk about one other thing we haven't mentioned at all and I knew who you were anyway, but I saw you on Count Me In on, on Netflix, which I've recommended anyone interested in drumming or any drummers that already play should watch anyway, just because it's so inspiring. So how did that come about? So how did they ask you to get involved? And like, what was the process with all that? So it's, I mean, it's so not rock and roll at all. Okay. All that happened was about six years ago, I got a phone call from Louise King, who I've known for years. She used to be the editor at Rhythm and she's been in the drum community for years and years and years. And she, all she said was, Look, we're just kind of, we don't really know what this is going to be, but do you fancy doing an interview? Like it might, nothing might come of it, but do you just fancy doing it? And me, I love to chat. So I was just like, yeah, sure. I'll come and chat on your thing. Like I have no idea. Like whatever anyway just turned up and it was just me her the director and a cameraman and mm. uh yeah just sat in this lovely flat asked me a few questions i chatted as i do <laughs> and then uh whenever it was two years ago uh no a year ago sorry <laughs> i got another phone call going oh by the way um yeah it's out as a documentary on netflix tomorrow <laughs> and i was like uh ah, <laughs> wait what what? <laughs> what are you talking about and then i i sort of watched it uh, they sent me a watch link and um i come from a family of uh so my dad is sort of in film and tv oh, so right. when i say that we have quite high standards uh when it comes to like that sort of like production values and stuff i was terrified because i was like oh my god I, I, what if this is terrible what if it's awful but the opening scene over the observatory in la and i was like oh my god it's gonna be good it's gonna be good and then i watched it and same as you i mean it, like irrespective of me being in it i was so inspired by yeah. everyone that was on there and i was just like oh my gosh we all share 
similar or the same sorts of stories and just that same feeling and, and that feeling of togetherness. I thought they captured so brilliantly and just the common threads that run through the just being a drummer, what that entails, what that feels like, how we feel about the drums, how we're inspired by people and our shared experiences. I just thought they did such a great job. And then the fact that I was in it as well, I was like, I have no idea why I'm here amongst these absolute legends, but I'm just really <laughs> grateful. <laughs> So I'm just going to just, I'll just be quiet over here. Don't mind me. But yeah, I just, I thought it was a great documentary just as a, as a viewer, you know. Apologies for interrupting this episode of Drum for the Song. I really hope you're enjoying it so far. I just wanted to take a few moments to tell you about my Patreon page. This is a place where you can support the podcast in exchange for some bonus content. You can head over to patreon.com forward slash drum for the song. There are three tiers available at the moment. One is £3 a month, one is £5 a month and the other one is £10 a month. Each tier grants you access to exclusive benefits which include bonus episodes early access to the main episodes, private Facebook group membership, merch discounts, discount on Motorhead Beer, as well as a monthly competition to win Motorhead Beer, access to Skype chats with me, asking my guests questions, occasional free gifts like drumsticks, free tickets to Phil Campbell and the Bastard Sons shows, and your name in the episode description. If you regularly enjoy the podcast and think you would enjoy those benefits too, please consider signing up. If you didn't already know, I do everything for this podcast all by myself. So I do all the contacting, all the research, all the interviews, all the audio editing, all the video editing, all the artwork, all the uploading. I write all the descriptions. I build the website. Everything is just me. So essentially, the money from the subscriptions helps me keep a bit of time free during my weeks so I can continue making the podcast for you guys. So again, that's patreon.com forward slash drum for the song. Check it out and enjoy the rest of the episode. Drum for the song podcast. Did you notice if it, if it opened many more doors for you or did your followers go up or anything after it? Or was it just, just, just great to be a part of it? Because there's a lot yeah, of exposure I mean, Netflix. Massive exposure. And there definitely was sort of like a spike in followers. But <laughs> funnily enough, literally the week before that happened, uh, my Instagram got deleted. Still don't know how it happened. I had 35,000 followers on there. I was verified, the whole thing. Oh, no. That was my main platform. And it got deleted. Still don't know why. So I started, I had to start a new profile from scratch, Nightmare. which is still building now, which is very annoying, but it is what it is. It's not the end of the world. So I don't think I got quite the bolster that I probably could have done. But at the same time, I definitely got like, definitely got some um, exposure and some lovely messages. I'm still getting lovely messages, uh, some funny messages from people who obviously I've known for years and they're just going, so I was just watching Netflix and why am I seeing you on Netflix? Like, <laughs> what the hell? And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, I just did this thing. And like I say, it's just so, it was so nonchalant, the beginnings of that documentary. Mm. And I know that all the other drummers on it were kind of feeling this, or a lot of them, the ones I spoke to felt the same. It's just like, oh, I just did an interview and it's turned into this thing. And it's funny. So um, obviously I sent you that video for the Taylor Hawkins tribute. Yeah, thanks And the again reason for that. that I was, oh, no worries. Um, yeah. The reason that I was able to sort of open up a conversation with him when I ran into him was like, oh, I think we're both, we've both done this documentary because this was before it was out. And I was like, the thing with Louise King? And he was like, oh, no way, you were on that too. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know what it is, but yeah. And so that kind of opened up the floodgates. And then we were both Zildjian and Dorsey. So that was another thing. And like, oh, we're family now. So yeah, let's yeah. have a chat. And uh, so it is amazing how just little things can open up doors in random ways that you can't even comprehend sometimes. So amazing uh well yeah. yeah so anyone who hasn't watched that count me in on netflix hopefully you've got netflix most people have these days um yeah, yeah. or someone's login 
<laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. I've been paying for it since it, ever, since it started, pretty much. Which is, I don't even want to think how much oh. I spent on it. But you know. <laughs> it's worth it, though. It's yeah, worth it. It's it very, is good. yeah, um, yeah. And right then, so let's let's talk about the remote recording studio, which I know you do. But you all, do you also run a course, or there's a there's a course on your website that you're offering to help other drummers who want to do the same thing. So I guess. This is your opportunity to kind of explain <laughs> what's available to them if they want to check that out. Yeah. So um, as I sort of alluded to earlier, I started my remote recording business in 2016 and that was off the back of Parting Ways with the Darkness because I kind of had this opportunity to sit down and go, right, what do I really love about drumming and what do I do want to do more of and less of, basically? And the thing that I realized is that I love, love, love playing songs. That's always been my thing since I very first started playing and that's why i love this podcast as well can i say as soon as i saw the title i was like this is my guy this yeah. is 100% my guy um and then i also love playing with loads of different people as well and the things that i wasn't really enjoying at the time were sort of long arduous rehearsals and stuff like that i'd been on tour so much and i was like maybe i want something that can keep me at home and i can have a routine and you know all this mm. sort of stuff wow. that i'd never had in my life before and anyway i realized that remote recording was probably the the thing to tick all those boxes so anyway i started up that business and um i sort of like struggled with it i mean when i tell you i didn't even know about preamps or like how that all worked i didn't know about mic placement or how to record all of that i just learned from scratch wow. which was okay. painful and it was long and um but yeah but i got to a point that it was working i was getting clients and that's the other thing the whole business side of it was zero knowledge like i just it, i'm a musician it's not it's not that's not doesn't come naturally to me so um i'd worked all this stuff out and then covid hit and i realized that there's going to be a lot of people that need to or want to p pivot into remote recording and i could just again i could see people going through exactly the same pain that i did that when they probably didn't need to so i just thought okay what i could do is to try and my small way of helping in this absolute madness let me create a course that can kind of help people with the business side of it like it's up to them how they decide to record like what preamps they're going to use mics da, 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 da. that's a whole different thing but the actual business side of getting clients you know getting yourself out there just how to price yourself um all that sort of stuff that again there's no information about yeah. it's just like well maybe i should be the person to tell people what i'm doing at least you know it's not gospel but it's certainly working because mm. i've managed to create a business from it and during covid i mean it's awful to say but i've never been so busy it's it's just ridiculous which oh. is i feel guilty saying that because obviously people had a really rough time but that was part of the thing i was like look i can help people to also thrive in this horrendous situation so yeah so i created this uh, course called the remote recording business course and it does just go through even the basic things of like having a website, what needs to be on your website, um, you know, how to build a portfolio if you haven't worked with anyone or don't like what you've got for a portfolio. Um, and even down to silly things like having a professional email address because nobody wants to get an email from bigboyrules69 at hotmail.com. <laughs> you know, that's, you're not going to hire someone with that email yeah, address. Um, but all those little things that you wouldn't have thought about, but I, I sort of have lived and I've, I've worked through and, and just sort of realized, all oh, right, yeah, like, okay, and this is where I can find clients and this is how I can keep coming back and this is how I can make the most of each person that I'm working with and, and then social media as well and, and sort of maximizing that. And uh, yeah, so, so if anyone wants to check that out, I mean, everything I do is at emilydrums.com. So you can just search through all of that, whether it's a drummer's guide to the podcast or YouTube series or the uh, remote recording business course or the actual studio or touring or blogs or whatever next yeah. I decide I'm going to go and venture into. Cause I, like I say, I, I'm not good at sitting still. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you give lessons at all? Is that something you've ever done? I, when I was much younger, I used to give lessons, but it was just by like, the local kids in the neighborhood just teaching them a bit to get a bit of money so that I could then go and do rehearsals or yeah. have petrol money to go to gigs. So that was literally the reason. Um, the only thing I do now is uh, just one-on-one -on -one sort of, I guess it's consulting. I don't like the term coaching because that's got a bit of a strange stigma to it at the moment, but just sort of like talking through people's uh, 
whatever their goals are professionally and then using my experience to kind of go well maybe you should try this or have you tried that mm. or you know maybe look at this that the other so uh yeah i sort of do these one-on-one i guess they're like zoom calls more than anything and just chatting about sort of getting plans together about getting that person to the next level in where they want to be basically so yeah again one of the other things i do to keep myself busy i don't know how <laughs> you squeeze it all trouble. In. yeah i have no <laughs> idea how you squeeze all everything in in fairness knowing how, how much you're away from home as well but fair play to you it's, yeah. it's fantastic it's really inspiring uh someone like myself who's probably a little bit too lazy with it all this keeps me busy i don't believe you you uh, run a successful podcast that take wow. i don't think people understand how much time and energy this is mm. the thing it's not even just the time it's the energy that it takes to yeah. do something like this yeah is huge and i have so i have such massive respect for you and what you're doing and the message that you're kind of like conveying and the chats that you have with the drummers it's just so nice and chilled and you know you feel like you're on a, fl a fly on the wall and there's all these little <laughs> nuggets of like information and and i just think it's wonderful so yeah. kudos to you massive kudos to you for what you're doing because i think yeah. it's absolutely phenomenal so please keep doing it <laughs> uh, thanks thanks that's that's really nice to hear because i've got my regular listener listeners and they go oh, yeah i enjoyed that one you know i don't really get many people giving me too much praise so sometimes i'm like oh. you do get those days when you're like Sh shall i do i need to keep doing this am i getting enough <laughs> from it so is it worth me yeah. putting all the energy into it because it's not it's not a financial thing. It's just that no. uh, I know that some people enjoy it, so I keep doing it. Yeah. So yeah, it was oh, the same for me. You. Yeah. Thank you. I yeah. understand. I t but I think it's it's such like I'm fascinated anyway by people's stories yeah. and and especially in the drum community. Mm. I remember as a kid being obsessed with reading autobiographies or interviews with drummers and trying to find common threads in what they were doing to be successful. And I feel like your podcast is exactly that but in this beautiful concise sort of way plus you're welsh which is awesome so <laughs> it's just wonderful to listen to thanks um, and you are a facilitator of someone that is also looking to do this professionally and they can go back and they can listen to all the stories and just work out oh cool okay well maybe if i try that or and you inspire people just by virtue of what you're doing yeah. so yeah i hope I, but i understand those moments of like do I want to carry this on? It's hard. Like it yeah. is hard some days to kind of muster up the energy to keep going. But I, I mean, obviously, never do anything and to your detriment. But yeah. you know, at the same time, I, I hope you do keep enjoying it enough to keep it going because it Thanks. is great what you're doing. Yeah, for sure. thank you very much. It's very kind of you. And I definitely need to catch up on the drummer's guide too because I've watched a few. And I'm like, right, there's like, I don't know, there's about 30 of them maybe or more. I don't know. The website and the think, channel just keeps going on forever. It's, really, it's so much yeah, content on there. I think it's more like, I think it's like 110 I, oh my episodes. God. So don't worry about getting through them. Just, <laughs> yeah, don't worry about that. You've got enough time. <laughs> well, I've got plenty of time. Oh, great. Okay. Um, right. That's fantastic. You've mentioned you're a Zildjian in Dorsey. Um, what mm. gear do you use for the people that are interested? I know, you know, not everyone is interested in all the gear, but I am. And a lot of the listeners are. Yeah. So what else are you using these days? Well, it depends what I'm doing, for sure. So at the moment on the Kim Wild gig, uh, I'm using a mixture of more kind of high, uh, like tonality sort of A's and uh, EFX crashes, just because I'm, I'm what I call affectionately the bonus drummer. So Johnny can have all of the regular stuff that you'd expect. And I have all the slightly strange stuff that not many people want to hear very often. Um, I don't have a China, mm. but... I have pretty much as close as in terms of like sonically, like a sort of a thing over there, yeah. uh, EFX. And then, yeah, just a couple of crashes and, and some hats and stuff. But then in the studio, I use slightly darker symbols. So a lot of Ks, um, the K sweet range, actually, mm. I've been using that recently, which is really, it's like a really nice balance between A's and Ks. Uh, it's kind of dark, but there's a lovely overtone of kind of crispness to it at the same time. They're not too heavy. You know, our K's can sometimes be a bit heavy and chunky yeah. sounding. They're kind yeah. of, they're a bit lighter, but still dark at the same time, which probably sounds like an oxymoron, but um, yeah. So, but I'm always, I'm always changing it up. I don't, I don't have sort of one set set up, if you know what I mean. I just kind of use things until I go, Oh, I fancy a change. Um, 
But yeah, I'm not sure if that answers your question particularly well. I'm terrible when it comes to gear because a lot of times, a lot of the time I'm like, I don't even know what I'm using. I just know that I like the sound of it. Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of my criteria. <laughs> oh, that's good. And like you said, some gigs call for different things and recording is different than live. So yeah, it's good to have the options and and so it's good to hear what you are using. What about like drums, sticks and heads? Is there anything in particular you go to or that you've used for a long time? Yeah, so uh, Sticks, Vic Firth, always been a Vic Firth gal since I was very young. Um, <laughs> and it, depending on what I'm playing, so if I'm on the Kim gig, I use 55As, which are kind of halfway between a 5A and a 5B. Yeah. It kind of, I think it's the weight of a 5B, but in the sort of casing of a 5A, if you like, uh, which is great. Um, gives a bit of power, you know, I just, I, I like that, that kind of aggressive type of heaviness. But then I have a complete opposite stick that I use in the studio a lot, which is the Keith Carlock signature stick, which is a very light stick. I'd kind of liken it to like, what is it like? Like a lacquered 8D maybe? So oh. it's, it's a lot lighter. It's a lot thinner. But the thing that I love about it the most is the tip on it. And and it was, who was it that put me onto this? Ralph Salmons, I think. He showed me a pair and I was like, oh, because the tip on the right it's one of the most beautiful sounding sticks on a ride I'd ever heard. And I was like, well, I've got to play those sticks. It's as simple as that. And mm. I haven't gone back. That was probably about six years ago. So, um, yeah, so Vic Firth for sticks. And then heads, Remo, generally I use just Emperor Coated. I love that thud. Yeah. The 70s kind of sound for me is just my, that's my favorite sound in all the land. Just that, ooh, it's just oh it's not you know there's barely any tone to it a lot of the time just, it's just yeah, like oh just sorry thud. about that but like yeah it just gets you in the stomach and yeah so um yeah so emperor yeah coated for for most of my drums um and then drums in the studio at the moment i've just got an old ludwig uh 67 super classic and Ooh. then on the road i have a yamaha 9000 which is like my workhorse it has been with me for 10 years now and i just adore it it's just it's it just sounds great all the time and i Whoa. always get great compliments about that kit and and i don't do anything i'm rubbish at tuning i can tune a little bit but i'm not like i'm not the best in the world but every time it's so easy to make it sound good and i'm like yeah great that's a great criteria for me because i yeah. don't want to spend hours tuning stuff and then it's going out of tune anyway like because it's sat in the sun on a stage for instance or yeah. you know it's just detuning every 10 minutes so uh yeah i love it i love my 9000 i think it, oh such a good kit such a good kit <laughs> well is it the reason they're so sought after isn't it so yeah amazing that's yeah. really cool um anything we haven't mentioned any tips for any musicians or drummers in 2022 <sighs> so many but uh okay let me think I think one that there's something that I keep thinking about recently, actually, I haven't really spoken about this yet, but because I get a lot of uh, like questions and people getting in touch about social media specifically, like, yeah, you know, tough. do you think it's a good thing? What should I be doing? Uh, da, da, da. Um, yeah. And it's a tough, it's a tough thing. It really, really is. And I also get a lot of people complaining about it. Like, oh, there's so many, pe it's so saturated. There's so many people, blah, 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 blah. But I feel like, I know social media is getting a really bad rap at the moment. It has done for a while. And I see there is a lot of toxic things about it at the moment, for sure. There's no negating that. I'm not trying to cover that up. But to me, the way that I see social media, it's kind of like having your own personal platform and essentially, like, it sounds really gross, but marketing service to the world. And that sounds really businessy and cold or whatever. But what I mean is, so when I was growing up and I was trying to get my name out there as a drummer, I didn't have social media. And to get an audition, you'd have to send in like a DVD or a VHS or just a tape or whatever. Um, or it would be through someone seeing you live on a show. Now, obviously, there's only one of me, so I can only be doing one show a night. Yeah. And if I'm doing that every night, I'm going to be knackered anyway. But also, it's only in one genre. It's, you know, there's, there's, it's very limiting. Whereas now, with social media, I feel like you can project the player that you are, the kind of gigs you want to be doing, you know, your personality as well, which, as we know, is such a huge part of getting on a gig. It's not just about the playing. It's about your personality, what you're like, if you get on with people, if you yep. think in a similar way to someone else. 
And I just think that there's so much opportunity on there. And and that, this is the other thing. I feel like people are trying to land grab when actually there's so much land. Like there's so much that people can be doing. And it's not about just having a gig anymore, you know, having, you know, the one Kim Wilde gig, for instance, which by the way, there's two seats on that gig now because there wasn't before. <laughs> but you know what I mean? You sort of create those opportunities for yourself. Mm. And I think it's the same with social media. You know, you've created this podcast, you've created a platform for yourself. There's things that we don't even know about yet that someone might decide to just try. And it might just be this massive thing. Things like YouTube dramas. People might poo-poo the YouTube drama. It doesn't matter. If you're earning a living playing drums, you're winning in my books. That's yeah. all I ever wanted to do was just earn a living playing drums. I happen to do that through touring, recording, doing a podcast. You know, I do all these peripheral things that aren't to do with drumming as well. But the reason that I'm able to do that is because of things like social media and being able to broadcast to the masses. This is me. I, this is the gig I'm doing. I'm currently out with Kim Wilde. Here's a cool picture of me playing with Kim Wilde. I'm currently playing with The Voice Kids. Here's a video of me playing on The Voice Kids. And people see that. And then I get calls for other gigs off the back of that. And I feel like there's this very short-sightedness of, if I'm not, you know, I don't want to be on social media. It's toxic. Rah, rah, rah. Okay, mm. that's fine. But you're doing yourself and your career a disservice. It's such an easy platform to broadcast to the yeah. world. And yes, you may only get, 20 likes. Don't worry about that. Just keep going because all it takes is one person. In fact, a great example of that is, um, so on YouTube, I have a video that I posted in 2011, I think. Wow. Uh, and it was a cover of the Foo Fighters Best of You. I'm wrapped in fairy lights. And that video is the reason that I got the Foo, um, the Foo Fighters gig. Ah, no, <laughs> not the Foo Fighters gig, the Darkness gig. Ah, right. And it's because yeah, they saw that video and then they asked around and it happened to coincide that one of their crew guys knew a crew guy who I can't even remember who it was, who was on a gig with me years ago, went, oh yeah, yeah, she's cool. Give her a call. Wow. That's the reason I got that gig is because they saw that YouTube video and were like, who's this then? Now that video, it was a one time putting it out there. I was terrified. I didn't want to put it out there. I found it cringy and I was like, why would anyone care? But I wouldn't be where I am right now if I hadn't have done that oh, one yeah, thing yeah. and then consistently kept posting things. So although it's scary and it might be a bit cringy and you think, oh my gosh, like, why am I doing this? You really, mm. really, when I tell you, you just don't know where things are going to lead. Yeah. You just plant that seed, leave it, move on to the next. Just don't, don't dwell on it. Just, just keep going. And then, like I say, you just never know what's going to come from it. So just do the thing. It's hard and it's terrifying, but it is, it is worth it. And it gets easier every time you do it also. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, that's such great advice as well. Um, that's one thing that does get me down a lot is that, that you you spend all this time producing the content, you just put it out there, and then there's no reaction. But it's, <sighs> and this is there for someone to discover maybe at a later date. I, I guess this certain YouTube yeah. is more of a long term format, I suppose, for people discovering things later on. Whereas Instagram is, I guess, more immediate. So sometimes it can be a bit gutting when you make this little trailer or something or video of you playing and. Then, you know, it doesn't quite yeah. get seen by as many people as, as you hoped. And and then I think that's partly to do with the algorithms and the fact that they think you might want to sell something. So they kind of hide it from people. And that's the most frustrating thing. And I understand yeah. anyone who's complaining about that stuff. I totally get it. But you've got yeah. to be on there if you want to put yourself out yeah. there, I think. 100%. And yeah. just know that everyone's in the same boat. Everyone, Unless yeah. you're, you know, one of these guys with you know, 5 million followers, even they, I bet you are feeling insecure and yeah. going, Oh my God, this video only got 5 million likes. Whereas the last one got 7 million, you know, yeah. I mean, it's yeah, just exactly. ridiculous. but the goal yeah. posts just move. Everyone's feeling insecure yeah. about their stuff. Like it just, it's the, it's the blessing and the curse of being creative. And it's the reason that we all strive to be better. It's the reason that we will always get better. Um, and, but it is the curse of it is you are going to feel that insecurity. It's a nightmare, mm. but it's absolutely brilliant at the same time. And the thing is, that's how innovation comes as well. And just pushing those boundaries. Um, yeah. and when the frustration comes with, like you say, for instance, Instagram changing the goalposts of what they're going to show followers or whatever, or not show your followers, then you become more creative about it. Okay, well, maybe I'll just try this and do that. And you might end up in a whole nother space that you didn't yeah. even know you enjoyed. Like a TikTok's a perfect example for me. 
I got onto TikTok a couple of years ago and I was like, this is, I am not about this. I tell you about three weeks in, I was like, I am so about, this is fun. <laughs> like doing dances and absolute silliness. But I was like, I don't care. I'm having fun. And that's really nice. What a nice thing to have a platform where it is very fun and jovial and you, but you can still get information out there. So yeah, just find the fun in it. I suppose that, yeah. that helps as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Fun is always good. Absolutely. TikTok. Yeah. I'm trying. Don't know if it's for me. <laughs> Maybe not for a podcast that's, anyway. That's fine. But I'm trying. Yeah, that's fine. That's the other thing. You, you can't do everything and you don't have to do everything. Yeah. That's the other thing. Like yeah. there's only so many hours in the day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And um, before we finish, because I know you've got a few hours, you've probably got busy things to do for the rest of your day. I've got a quick, quick fire round, if you don't mind, before we end. Yeah, go which, for which it. is always fun. So people get to know you a little bit more. Uh, not okay. always drum related. Some of them are. Uh, what's your favorite food? Oh gosh, oh, I love food so much. Um, favorite food? Can I give you like a meal? Yeah. So like jerk chicken, rice and peas, and plantain. I'd say that's like yeah, that's one of my favorite meals. Oh, nice, nice, nice. Delicious. Uh, favorite movie? Oh my! Oh, these are really horrible questions. <laughs> really sorry. Um, favorite movie? Oh, okay. All right. It's what's popped into my head. Spirited Away. Wow, that's really strange because I was, me and my wife have been watching uh, some of those movies and that's next on our list. So that's strange you said that. <gasps> have you not seen it yet? I, have you we, not we seen it? We watched it years ago, but we want to watch it again. Yeah. Okay. Oh, but, I just think it's beautiful, yeah. beautiful film. Okay. Yeah. Uh, guitar or bass? Guitar. Nylon or wood tip? <laughs> oh, wood tip, obviously. <laughs> this is always a hard one. John Bonham or Neil Peart? Oh, that's ultra tough because Neil Peart was one of the first drummers I knew consciously about. Yeah. But I'd say that John Bonham has influenced my playing the most, like more. Mm. So I have to go John Bonham. I'm going to okay. have to go John Bonham. That's I'm sorry, good... Neil. I'm sorry. That's a good reason. Uh, Beatles or Rolling Stones? Beatles. Big or small venue? <gasps> Small venue. Oh, I okay. love a small gig, an intimate gig. There's nothing like it. Oh, yeah, I know what you mean. They can be, they can be the best ones sometimes. Uh, favorite yeah. time signature. Oh, just four, four, cut, four, four. Yeah. Good, good, <laughs> good. Like that. <laughs> favorite rhythm section, and by that, like guitar and bass. No, sorry, drummer and bass player in like a band or whatever. Oh. Oh, that's a toughie, that one. i tell you one that I always really, oh, I've got two in my head right now, although technically the bass player is the same. So I'm going to give you two because I'm being annoying. That's all right. Pino Palladino Ooh, yeah. and Another Welshman. either Questlove, so on the D'Angelo album Voodoo. Oh, wow. Love that. I haven't heard or that. Or Pino, you haven't heard that? No. Oh, please, please listen to it. Okay. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's so phenomenal. Um, <laughs> or Pino Palladino and Steve Jordan on the Continuum album. Because no. I just, I played that, well, I played both those albums to death, to death. Yeah. So yeah, probably them. <laughs> oh, that's, that's incredible. Continuum, yeah, I've listened to that about 10 zillion times. Amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. It's perfect um, album. It is, yeah. Um, name an underrated band. Oh, I'll give you a good one. Uh, Haunt the Woods. They're a fairly new band from okay. Cornwall. They kind of sound like a mix between Radiohead and Jeff Buckley. Ooh, sounds yeah. interesting. Really okay. quite something special. Cool. Yeah. Check those I, out. I hope they do well. <laughs> I'll check them out. Um, Favourite album of all time? <gasps> Um, oh, these are really horrible <laughs> questions. Okay, uh, okay. Al Green, call me. Oh, cool. Uh, favorite <laughs> drummer of all time. This is the last one. Um, Lee Von Helm. Ah, oh, okay, okay, good, good, good one. Okay, th <laughs> so that that was a quick fire round. And the very last okay, question for you is: if if you could create your own dream band with yourself on drums, who would you have playing the other instruments? And they, they can be dead oh. or alive. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Um, oh, okay. 
So th these are all just going to come from basically my other answers. Uh, <laughs> Pino Palladino on bass. Yeah. Um, let's have Jeff Buckley on vocals. Let's have... Um, who should we have on guitar? I mean, I'm, uh, this is going to be the weirdest band ever, but uh, I, Jimi Hendrix, only because I grew up listening to Jimi and I love him. Yeah. Um, I, I let's have another guitarist too, yeah. Johnny Greenwood, um, and Keys, Garth Hudson, because he is just amazing to watch. So he was he was in the band as well. So yeah, uh, amazing. I just love him. Yeah. Class. Okay, there you go. <laughs> this is good. I don't know what the music's going to sound like, but I'm going to have a good time. Yeah, yeah. That's the, that's the, I think that's the idea, really, isn't it? I think um, yeah. with that question, <laughs> it always comes up with some interesting and peculiar combinations but no that was, Mixes, that was really yeah. good yeah really good um yeah so if people want to follow you on social media you mentioned that your instagram your old instagram page got uh deleted so what what are your new ones and facebook and all that what yeah if you just look up emilydrums.com on anything and everything just that's you'll find me that you is you'll find me amazing <laughs> yeah. um emilydrums.com thanks so much uh for taking the time today and sorry it took so long to kind of nail the appointment, I suppose. Um, <laughs> best of luck uh, with the studio and uh, your future touring endeavours. If you're ever in South Wales, holler at me. I'm not too far from Car yeah. Cardiff, if you're playing in Cardiff or anything like that. I think we're playing St. David's Hall in September with oh. Kim. So oh. you'll have to come to that show. Yeah, <laughs> now yeah, you've yeah. said that on air, you're going to have to come to that yeah, show. <laughs> as, yeah, September... I think I'm home for most of September. So yeah, let me know the date and um we'll sort that, it out. I'd love yeah. that. I'd love that. That'd be great. I'll see if my Amazing. My, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Um yeah. Well, thank thanks. you so much for having me, Dane. Oh. It's, it's been such a pleasure and and I know it's been a long time coming, but it's been so worth the wait. And as I say, please just keep doing what you're doing because I, I love it. I, I'm a fan of the podcast anyway, so to ah. be on it as well is is a really nice thing. So thank oh. you so much for having me. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure, Emily. So very good. Um right, I'll let you get on with your very busy day and very busy schedule, and we'll speak soon, no doubt. And I'll see you in September, hopefully. I really hope so now. I'll nice. really look forward to that. Right. Cool. Thank you. Nice one. And thanks Thank for you. listening, everybody. Drum for the Song Podcast. Thanks for listening to this episode of Drum for the Song Podcast. If you've enjoyed this, please consider liking the video and subscribing if you're watching on YouTube or subscribe and follow wherever you get your podcasts. If you could leave me a review or comment, that would be fantastic too, as it helps other people discover this show. Please also consider sharing this with any family members or friends who might enjoy the content. You can also follow me on social media at Dane underscore drums, or at Drum for the Song, or search for Drum for the Song on Facebook to follow the page and join the official Facebook group. If you'd like to support the podcast, you could purchase some merchandise from drumforthesong.com or consider supporting me via Patreon from just £3 per month for additional exclusive content like bonus episodes, video calls with myself, competitions, discounts, and much more. Any additional support is always greatly appreciated but I would like to give extra special thanks to my top tier Groove Master patrons whose names are listed in the description below. My name is Dane Campbell and thanks so much for watching or listening this far. If you're a drummer, don't forget to drum for the song. <laughs>